Hey, if anything, one of the things I enjoy doing most in this channel is demolishing BS. Today, that's what we're going to do. So here goes. 95% of studios are working on or aim to release a live service game per a report passed on to GameIndustry.biz. Now, that seems like a pretty unbelievable figure, right? The sheer idea that 95% of our industry could actually be working on live service games is kind of absurd, especially when we've got studios like Naughty Dog who are using the rejection of the live service practice effectively as a marketing beat for their studio. Well, the thing is, there's a secret behind that number. So today, we're going to take you through what that 95% means, what even happened with the report, and how you can arm yourself with knowledge going forward. But first, let's defend our war chest with today's sponsor. There ain't a sponsor, but you can still help us. Hitting the subscribe button essentially gives the algorithm a happy signal. It would really help me out if you subscribe to the channel. Most of our viewers actually aren't subscribed. It's just part of how YouTube works these days. But that gives the algorithm a happy signal, and that means it'll spread our content to more people, and that really helps. Same with the like button. Those things actually do make a dent. They're a great zero-cost way to support the show. It'll take three seconds, maybe five. My end of the bargain, of course, is I will bring my A-game to this show, and I'll also bring my A-game to supporting the team behind this show as best I can so that we can bring you the best news, the best research, that's our ambition. Thank you for your support, and let's go. Okay, so GameIndustry.biz posted this late last Friday, and the internet basically erupted. Because right then, we had the launch of Suicide Squad, which was, for some people, supposed to be, you know, a, a line in the sand, a collective audience saying, nope, you've gone too far, live services have just killed the Arkham games, we've had enough. So into that environment goes this headline that 95% of people in games are working on games like Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, like all the other live services that are going on. As such, people have had very large reactions. I'm going to go first to the managing editor of GameSpot, Tamori Hussein, who said, are they also working in lowering hours, increasing wages, and creating new pockets of time and extra days in the week? You may think he's talking in this case about, you know, developers, because these are big, horrible games to work on. Uh, no, actually. He goes on to say, because that's the only way 90% of those will find an audience large and dedicated enough to deem the project a success. The basic idea being, all right, cool. So if we're all going to be, you know, stitched onto the, uh, I don't know, stitched onto the teeth of the live services, I don't know, we're going to need like an eighth day in the week called Gamer Day, where we all get to put money and time into live service games. To keep on going, we've got Andrew Fay, the PlayStation 2 manifesto. And I don't know about you guys, but I can really get behind this manifesto. So seven to 13 hours of content. Combine a few old ideas in a new way or have a big new idea. No complicated character upgrade trees, limited online, little post-launch support, two-ish years, 30 devs. Thanks for your money. On to the next game. <laughs> Does that not sound like a little bit of a dream? Then, of course, those in the know takes Fen, who is the, well, the head of Larian, who did Baldur's Gate 3. By definition, this will affect the design, so I'd call that an opportunity for the remaining 5%. Yeah, in a world where that's true, I think we should all be thinking about non-live service games. What if, though? What if, and here's the shocking thing, we actually went and read the report? And what if we were able to absolutely tear the report to pieces and find out the biases that are driving this entire thing? Because, oh boy, this story actually goes a little bit more than you would have thought. Right then, the headline is technically true, and the report is utter bollocks. So let's go and dissect it. This is a report sent out to the industry-focused press. So, you know, that's GameIndustry.biz. That's VentureBeat. You know VentureBeat, where Dean Takahashi gets to, you know, travel the world, cozy up to people, go, uh, you know, go and uh, sort of be access journalism for the big companies. We all love it when he does that. Anyway, these are the kind of reports that turn up all the time in the inboxes of, uh, you know, these sites of these journalists. Typically, right, they're provided along with a key fact sheet. They usually come with a link to a report and the provider of the report. And the idea basically is, hello, industry press, here's a report, here's some key facts. Could you please just, uh, you know, rewrite the key facts, publish it? 
Thanks. Essentially, you know the way like a think tank can basically find whatever numbers or statistics that they want to support their argument and then they can essentially get that via, you know, the regular talking heads, pretty much whatever airtime they want on say the you know, regular uh, the regular ass media. It's kind of similar stuff going on here. So here's the report. It's called 2023 Game Development Report. Very grand of a title. Uh, now they surveyed 547 studios across the globe and that immediately does give you a bit more confidence in the findings. I mean, that's a pretty damn good sample size. And the report has three key takeaways. Let's go through them. So, Takeaway number one, game development costs are increasing as studios try to keep up with trends. 77% reported that the cost of game dev is rising. That is absolutely the case. Indeed, we're in an era where we went from basically no inflation to, hello, inflation, I'm here and I'm going to ruin your day. Which, uh, yeah, even if you're making the same game like now versus a few years ago, it's going to cost you more money now. Okay, 65% is takeaway two. 65% currently working on a title with a regular update cadence for their game and take away three 88 percent of respondents are actively evaluating new tools to bring into their workflows i mean what a stunning surprise you know massive headline companies trying to be competitive are looking into new tools yeah amazing i wonder how much the consultants involved in this were paid for their amazing analysis let me continue though each of these do essentially make sense they paint a picture of an industry that's relying more in tech where the majority of games are live service models with rapidly increasing costs but the biggest figure here is 65 percent Let's break this down and look at the actual relevant uh, page, the relevant numbers where we see uh, currently working on a title delivering live services, intend to release or transition a title to live service, and no plans for live service in any upcoming title. Okay, look at the 65%. That's currently doing a live service. But uh, what's the, what's this? What's this? Look, there's an asterisk. How about we look at this little asterisk where it says live service is defined as any regular update cadence planned for a game. The word any there is pretty large. So, according to this classification, I want to uh, talk about some live service games. Of course, we, we hate how live services are ruining industries. These awful live service games like Elden Ring, greedy bullshit, Baldur's Gate 3, essentially a scam, Spider-Man 2, fake game, Dredge, worse than Satan, Lies of P, obviously, Phil Spencer. There you go. And obviously, you're probably uh, realizing, actually, no, none of those are live service games. But according to this report that then got the whole internet exploding, they are being defined as live service games. Now, what if I told you that uh, we can then look a little bit further into the report and find out some very interesting and relevant details? Uh, so, basically, every game that is released and then gets a patch is technically a live service game. In fact, our video game, The Pale Beyond, you know, we did patches to fix bug fixes and we did a free content patch that had a pretty large number of expanded epilogues for the game. So, I suppose... Oh damn, I woke up and found out that I too am making a live service game. Whoops. Now, I'm going to scroll up and we're just going to take a little look here. Who are these people? Who are Rendered VC and Griffin? Could they have anything to do with this report? Well, what if I told you the answer was yes? Okay, let's get into it then. So, uh, Griffin Gaming Partners are a venture capital company, right? Uh, let's let's uh, maybe take a look at their portfolio. When you do that, you see that they've actually got some studios like Frost Giant, who, uh, you know, Frost Giant, they're awesome. They're working in Stormgate. Technically a live service. Uh, I mean, overtly a live service. We've got Second Dinner, who, of course, are doing the, uh, the Marvel Snap game. That's also a live service. Uh, but there's also Telescope Labs. Now, Telescope Labs are, uh, well, I'll just let them explain it themselves. Data analytics stack and ML-powered economy engine for helping Web3 game economies to achieve sustainability. Or another group, uh, Anonym, who are decentralized Web3 ad tech company focused on the gaming industry, or of course Hyperplay, who are Web3 native game launcher, enabling players to carry their wallet, NFT tokens, and achievements into every game. That's right, you could take your achievements from Baldur's Gate 3 and bring them into some, uh, I, I don't know, gambling, you, you earn money when you shoot people game, who, who the hell knows. Uh, how, how fun. So that's Griffin covered. What about Rendered? Well, Rendered are another venture capital firm, and taking a look at 
at what they invest in, essentially you've got a lot of tech. Like here's uh, Synapse, a digital operating system for Hollywood. Hathora, serverless cloud platform for multiplayer games. Inworld, AI-powered virtual character creation platform, and you know, so on and so forth. There's one here that's an AI-powered tagging of 3D content uh, company. Another one that does cross-platform forever game. Yeah, I mean, that's barely a sentence, but anyway, that's what they're doing over at Gardens.dev. Basically, a lot of this is just tech that would benefit some uh, live service companies. Now, I don't want to be overly conspiratorial here, but we do have two venture capital firms who are pretty heavily invested in live games and a lot of the sort of future of gaming tech. Uh, very much, they're not invested in the PS2 manifesto, which uh, I think a lot of us would rather prefer. Uh, so yeah, they are pretty heavily involved in this area. This almost feels like an entire report that is designed to drive interest into the kinds of industries and uh, companies that the report makers have, uh, you know, got a direct financial interest in. So what happened here is game industry, I, I don't want to say lazily, but I mean, I suppose they did just kind of lazily, well, repost the damn thing, which, you know, remember, this is them lazily reposting a report commissioned or, you know, done for two venture capital firms. You're like, uh, you know, follow the money? Is Could they potentially have a horse in this race? So essentially this report, what we are doing today is essentially getting you to think about what you are seeing. Uh, I, I guess critically, I don't mean that in a demeaning way, but it's to point out, like you probably saw this headline go all over the internet. It seems strange. Like I think about 95% of games that I play are interested in, and uh, some of them are live services. A lot of them are not. Some of this just doesn't stand the gut check. And with this outlook, I want to talk about another story that spread all over the internet. That is the story that apparently Hasbro was going to sell D&D to Tencent via Larian, which uh, certainly would have been a very interesting turn of events. So here's the deal. Tencent are not buying Dungeons & Dragons, which may fly in the face of certain headlines that you saw, which pretty much said Tencent are looking to buy Dungeons & Dragons. That was the headline, a predominant one for about half of a day. Now, understandably, this was a pretty spooky thing to many people. A lot of us love D&D, we don't exactly want Tencent to, in a mercenary fashion, gobble it up. Uh, of course, not that we uh, love Hasbro corporate for many different reasons. Now, the good news is that's complete bollocks. Yep, none of this was true, at least in the way that it was initially reported. So what happened here is this came from a Chinese language news site called Speed Daily. And what was on Speed Daily was then being reported by the English presenting Pan Daily. So we got Pan Daily reporting on Speed Daily. Now, the body of the problem here came from these excerpts in Pan Daily's reporting on this issue, as well as the headline that framed it. They said this, according to informed sources, the financial crisis faced by Hasbro is the main reason for considering the sale of D&D. And Tencent Investments' Larian Studios is acting as an intermediary in this transaction. However, due to insufficient funds, Larian ultimately introduced the deal to shareholder Tencent. Now, there's a few things to think about here. Uh, yes, Larian is owned in a way by Tencent, but only 30% of their value is owned by Tencent. Now, 25% ownership in a company is usually enough to have some influence, uh, enough at least that a bank would consider you to be a significant party, but being a significant party does not mean that you are in charge. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is Hasbro, and yes, it is actually true that Hasbro are in financial difficulties. You probably realize they're laying people off left, right, and center. Uh, indeed, that's even connected to Larry and people from Larian are saying, hey, the people over at Wizards of the Coast who we were working on on Baldur's Gate 3, loads of them are gone. And uh, yeah, that absolutely is the case. But the thing is, Wizards of the Coast is actually doing very well, and the division that's driving those losses is their toys division. So that's odd. It would also be very odd if Larian, a relatively speaking small privately held company, decided to just somehow acquire Dungeons & Dragons, and then there's all sorts of weirdness going on with the article. The headline suggests the IP is being sold. The opening uh, paragraph doesn't really reflect that. Uh, later in the article, they go on to say that Tencent is in negotiation with the aim of acquiring a series of rights, including adaptation rights for electronic games such as D&D, but with the framing that they previously had problems with restrictive licenses, which does sound more likely, but that's actually not what the headline described, and it's not what the framing of the initial paragraph suggests. This whole thing is so weird. And uh, that essentially meant that the entire social media, like, rumor mill about D&D &D being sold to Tencent via Larian was essentially a whole bunch of BS. And uh, various writers then sort of picked up on those. I mean, from Massively, we have an article, Hasbro is selling the Dungeons & Dragons IP, and Tencent is the potential buyer. And, uh, that's... 
not true. At least loads of people did say reportedly, which is a really powerful word. It's one of those words that's a bit like allegedly, right? Because then it puts the burden of proof on the people that you are using as a source, right? You're just passing along what is being reported around the place, and that does kind of make you somewhat in the clear. And when they applied the sniff test, they weren't just in a position where they were just passing along information to people, they also would be able to reach out to the Wizards of the Coast PR department, which they did, and this is what they said. We regularly talk with Tencent and enjoy multiple partnerships with them across a range of IPs. Uh, We don't make a habit of commenting on internet rumors, but to be clear, we are not looking to sell our Dungeons & Dragons IP. So, no deal, right? Uh, The IP stays with Hasbro. Maybe they're talking to Tencent about, like, licensing the property for, like, a game or something, but overall, it's not as it was initially spreading around the internet. It is, I suppose, good news all over, because with that confirmed, we can now go through the chain of events, where a Chinese-language site posted their sourced information about corporate dealings regarding a very, you know, popular uh, product. Then a second site, this time presented in English, relays the information, but really does seem to have lost stuff in translation. Then English-speaking internet denizens and writers pick up on this because it's relating to things that they care about. And of course, I mean, Dungeons & Dragons is going to do really well as like a, you know, a headline uh, that will grab people's attention given Baldur's Gate 3, I suppose also given that the movie was pretty damn successful. Then people write up a story taking Pan Daly as a verified source because I suppose you can just assume that they have their own editorial pass, right? I mean, hey, it went to print over there. It already went through one, you know, whole series of editorial controls. Therefore, we can just go and post it. The problem there is that most people with any kind of editorial backing, uh, they also don't have the capacity or even the time to send things out for comment and, you know, wait for stuff to come back because, well, you know how fast the pace of news is. If you don't go to print on your story, someone else will, unless it's, say, your own investigative reporting and, you know, it's you know that it's kind of airlocked down and it's not really going to leak anywhere. And I think this tweet actually sums things up pretty well. Just reminding everyone, for no reason at all, wink wink, uh, that the average writer for games news and reviews websites has not been to journalism school, is paid less than a greeter at Walmart, and has millions of people online holding them to the same standards as an Anderson Cooper. So, you can kind of see how these misunderstandings spread, because the audience is, in this case, three steps removed from the original source and an entire language removed. Uh, And of course, a language that, uh, you know, if we're going to talk about sort of the Anglophone sphere, a pretty damn different language we're dealing with, right? Not everything will translate perfectly easily. I mean, if you're going like Spanish to Portuguese or, you know, French, you can kind of see where a lot of that stuff comes from. But of course, Chinese is a very, very, very different language indeed, which does make those translations uh, quite a bit harder. I mean, how many times, even in the last few years has machine translated stuff from China ended up creating just whole big stories when ultimately nothing existed. So overall, what this means to you is, look, mistakes like this happen. You can see the complex chain of things and the incentives of speed and the internet. People are going to make mistakes. We've made mistakes. I've made mistakes. Um, it, it does happen and, you know, we do our best to, uh, to sort of fix up those things. But I think it just means that have that sniff test for yourself. If you see a headline saying that 95% of developers are working on live service games, and that makes you feel like angry, sad, a bit depressed about the state of the hobby you care about, apply the sniff test, because it turns out it might actually be a whole load of bollocks designed for other people's incentives spread around the internet, completely inaccurately misleading you. And that kind of sucks, because ultimately, You like to believe what you see, but when what you're seeing is words, well, often you can't believe what you see. And that really is making so much of the modern world very complicated and a bit dangerous. Okay, that's it for today's story. I hope you found this one to at least be an interesting one. And hey, I think we can all relax, safe in the knowledge that that 95% number is a big old load of bollocks. All right, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you next time.